raise a family, that they have some of the same opportunities that me and my wife. You agreed that they are, we need to see them as a terrorist organization. On a private cloud server, yes or no? To, to love country, to love God, and, and to try to do the right thing. Worked for the nation and the interests of the people. Welcome back to the Fresh Freedom Podcast. I'm Eric Burleson. As you know, this is a podcast with the freedom-loving freshman members in the House of Representatives, where we provide you a behind-the-scenes look at what's happening in Congress. Today, I'm joined by my fellow conservatives, freshman Josh Burkeen from Oklahoma and Keith Seltz from Texas. Later, we may have uh, Andy Ogles from Tennessee join us. But first, I want to welcome our new co-host to the Fresh Freedom Podcast, Keith Self. Uh, Keith, tell everyone who may not know about your background, tell us why what, about your background and why in the world would you want to be a member and, of Congress and subject yourself to what we've been through? Well, because I see what, what's happening in our nation just like you saw what's happening in our nation. Uh, that's why I'm here. I was happily retired for three years uh, from the county judge position and uh, hiked in the Alps, river rafted in Alaska, wow. toured northern Italy and um, somebody asked me to do this, I decided to do it, and through God's grace, here I am, uh, because we got to do something about this situation. So you're native-born Texan, or did you migrate to Texas like a lot of people? No, not, my parents met at Midwestern in Wichita Falls. My mother's from the Panhandle, my dad's from the Wichita Falls area, but my dad was in the Army when I was born. So I was born in the Naval Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I didn't get to Texas for the first time till I was five weeks old. <laughs> okay, so you're pretty, you're... I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Texan, dyed in the wool te- fifth generation. That's awesome. And so tell us about your background. So you, you went to school in Texas, then you joined the military, right? Well, I went to West Point uh, in New York, and then I, of course, joined the military because that's the deal. Uh, spent uh, 25 years total. I like to jump out of airplanes which we've talked about, and uh, that is more fun than the law allows. So had about 10 years of that and about uh, another 10 years plus of uh, kind of overseas in the joint headquarters, Pentagon, embassy in Cairo, uh, European command, NATO command in in Belgium. Uh, So, and then central command uh, for the last Afghanistan and Iraqi freedom. So, I know, because I heard this not only from Keith, but his wife, Tracy, they also, in all those years that they served, um, they also had a time period where he had to James Bond, um, have a rifle in in his hand and skis on his feet uh, getting around Europe. Like he had to have that type of uh, training. So why don't you tell them about your your, uh, time in the Alps? Well, you're asking about uh, time with the Special Forces Battalion, the Green Berets. Uh, So my job for six weeks every year was to learn to ski better. Mm. Uh, So every year... Sounds awful. Yeah, every year... What year was this? This is Cold War era? Cold War era. Yeah, what year? Uh, Late 70s, early 80s. Okay. So every year we would take a 50-mile summer march through the mountains up and down, in the wintertime, we would take our skis. So they'd drop us off from a helicopter. Keith, where is this? Tell the people where we're talking about. Just north of Austria in southern Germany, in the Alps. Okay. Uh, so we would ski down the hills. We'd put on our skins and walk up the hills. Uh, so that's how you got around in the mountains. James Bond, man. James Bond. Who jumps out of perfectly good airplanes. Yep. But you've, and you, you were telling us that you've actually jumped into water as well. I have, yeah. Water jumps are, are just, they're, they're great fun. I mean, those are fun jumps. They're not tactical jumps, they're just fun. So we do get one of those jumps occasionally. And how do you keep from drowning when the parachute is collapsing on top of you? Well, you go down and around it. Down. You get out from underneath it. Do they teach it. you that in a swimming pool first? Well, they tell you about it. Like, do they let you go off a high dive and bring your parachute and then no. like... No. You have to learn this in open water for the first time. Well, it's a lake. It's not the Okay, ocean. but I mean, okay, yeah. wow. That's, I mean, it's, but it's, this is not like falling out from underneath the size of an umbrella. I mean, this is a parachute. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's what you use to parachute oh, with. It. It's a parachute. I actually have jumped out of a plane one time, so about 10 years ago, and I didn't do the tandem. I actually did it on my own. I did the same thing. I'll never do it again. 
Um, I did it with my father. He was on a work trip, and he talked us boys into going with him. And uh, he was, I could hear him squealing. My dad loved it. Like he's squealing on the way down. I and mean, we're all had to get trained and pull your own rip cord. Nobody there doing it for you. I get to the ground. It destroyed me emotionally. My father is like, let's do it again, boys. I'm like, no more, no more. So, so 13, five. That's how many times you've done it? 13? No, no, 13,500. What'd you jump at? Man, I don't know. All I know is the guy <laughs> the, the guy in the plane was saying jump, and I was thinking, am I an idiot? Why am I about to do this? The, I did it, and they, the guy made us climb out on the wing. Like I didn't you do had that. to, like, no, the, the plane that we were on, we had to, like, you, you got outside the door, you put your foot on, and then you hung the other foot out, and you grabbed the strut that holds the wing, really? and you had to, like, inch your way out, and then holding on to it. So that was the best part because you're holding on to the plane from the outside and then you let go. Wow. How many jumps have you done out of a plane? Uh, even hundred. Did you ever get to the point where you thought like, I don't want to do this anymore? Oh goodness. No, uh, no. I asked uh, to do the D day jump uh, when I wasn't even on jump status when I was in Europe. So, uh, no, you now, want to jump as much as you can. Clarify D-Day, because I know that you weren't there for D-Day. What do you mean the this was D-Day the, jump? This, this was the 40... 40- <laughs> I want to make sure we're clarifying. <laughs> this was the 40... Four- <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for I know, asking. I know, I know that you weren't there. Go ahead. This is the 49th anniversary, okay. which would have been when? The mid-90s sometime. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, 93, I guess. 49th anniversary. So y'all parachuted like the, like the 101st Airborne? Like y'all retract their steps? I jumped, I jumped on one of the original 101st Airborne Division drop zones in France. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. awesome. That is it was, awesome. It was wonderful. The, the veterans were in their 70s back then. So they watched us jump. Uh, when I landed, I landed right next to a stream. A uh, perfectly restored American Jeep pulled up next to me. This is in France. To include a rifle in the scabbard on the, on the oh, Jeep. Wow. Uh, gave me a ride to the turn-in point and spent a wonderful three days. We heard the old vets telling stories. There was one lady who had been in the French Maquis, uh, the resistance, and she had a crowd around her telling us how she blew up German trains, and mm-hmm. it was it was wonderful three days. Really That's was. awesome. Yeah. So, but you got you you and your wife met while you were serving at West Point. At yeah, West Point, of course, we can't get married at West Point, so we got married right. How'd out. you and Tracy meet at West Point? What was she doing out there? Uh, she was in Pennsylvania, and after a Rutgers West Point football game, I got invited over to her Young Life family. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I met her at a young. That's, like Young Life was the inspiration for Canacuck, which Eric yeah. knows about because Canacuck's yeah. in his congressional district. Yeah. So Joe, why mm-hmm. he runs Canacuck, was a part of. I think he had a like it was uh, a role like, in Young Life, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. his dad started out of Texas, mm-hmm. uh, started took over the Canacuck ministry. But you know the Young Life ministry was I, I know instrumental for him. And yeah, so yeah. yeah, cool. And then service in the military, and you became a now that in, in Texas you call them judges, county judges, but where I'm from we call them county. We call them presiding county commissioners. Mm-hmm. So can you explain for folks what what does the county judge in Texas do? Sure. Every county in Texas has a commissioner's court of five people. Whether you've got a couple of hundred like Loving County or you've got three million like Harris County, Houston, uh, you have five people. Uh, Four are commissioners elected by precinct. The county judge is elected countywide. And uh, he is under the Texas Constitution, a judge. He is liable for the judicial ethics uh, serves uh, serves as a true judge by the Constitution, but he's the presiding officer of the commissioner's court, as you say. And so I imagine you you had to oversee a lot of controversial issues at times, well, serving well, that role, or something. Were you kind of the referee during that time period? Did you have a vote yourself? Oh no, you have a vote yourself, and uh, when you become the county judge, the first thing you learn is how to count to three, <laughs> of course, out of five. So yes, we did have some very controversial issues, but I did not, I I took an active part. Uh, I didn't just become the referee. I don't think that's the role of the county judge. In fact, he's the leader of the court and pretty much in Texas, the face of the county. So how does that work in terms of cases that would be outside? When we think county commissioner role in Oklahoma, it's gonna be way different than this. Uh, unless the scope is the same. I mean, what, what was your jurisdictional uh, responsibilities? I, I, I could have heard 
uh, probate cases. I chose not to. Okay. So all I did was the administrative job, which is the tax rates, building roads, uh, funding all of the other elected the, officials yeah, the, in the county. The county okay. jail or the, co the county, county sheriff's office. The, the, the DA, the county clerk, the district clerk, the sheriff, on and on and on. Jail mm -hmm. is certainly the biggest uh, expenditure in the county budget. So we had about a million people uh, in our county. So, uh, wow. you know, we, wow. we had... And you did that for how long? 12 years. 12 years. Three, three terms. Great. And then I... That's the congressional district that you now represent. All of that was something that you represented in that position? Uh, it is included in my congressional district. We've added a county. Uh, okay. So I've got two counties as opposed to the one county. Well, we, we appreciate you coming on. We, uh, from the very beginning, we've, we've all came in as freshmen together. Yeah. And it, it's been neat to see um, how some people fall into different votes. Um, I would say you're definitely on the more conservative side of things. What has been your perspective these last few months about um, what it's like? What, what were your expectations? Have, have this, has this place like exceeded your expectations? What did you, or, or, or not exceeded? I will tell you the big gulf that I see, the big disparity that I see is the way people talk, and the way they vote. Oh, yeah, <laughs> That's amen. It. That's pretty. Stop <laughs> exactly. the show. That's it. That is it. Yes, and yet, what I find it interesting that there's so many of, of the people here. I was just in a conversation tonight with a group of of our colleagues, and they were the conversation was well, people back home just don't understand, right? They just, they just don't they just don't know that it's more complicated than some of these things. And my, my thought is, is it really that complicated? I don't, some of these issues are not so complicated. Well, I think if you go back to what our founders envisioned, I was thinking about this today, driving through your congressional district from Oklahoma, I have to drive through um, his congressional district quite often because I live just north of the red and uh, I was catching a, a flight um, out of Dallas. And I was thinking about, you know, how the, the brilliance of the founders knowing that the closer you keep government to yourselves locally, the more control you have. And those small little 18 things in Article 1, Section 8 that they wanted the federal government to be involved in so that, you know, almost every intricacy of our lives would not be handled up here and how it's flipped on its head now. Um, and how much of it is turned into Washington, D.C. is uh, involved in everything. So much so that most of us up here asked to be experts on everything, and our founding fathers never wanted it to be that way. They wanted us to focus on the 18 and let, you know, all the way down to the local governance that you operated under be where the real reign of, of power was. I don't think the issues are complicated. The strategy up here gets is what makes it complicated. How are we going to cater to that group or this group or meld them together. The strategy is what makes it complicated, not the issue. People overthink things here because they've got so many groups of people that they have to cater to. Yeah, and I think that there, there becomes this bubble mentality, so people, or this <laughs> echo chamber, so that people who congregate in one particular group, they start hearing those voices and then they stop listening to what their district is, is saying to them. What are the voices? Spend, spend, yeah, cut, spend. Oh, maybe spend, cut. Oh, we can't, for example, all these Holman rules. You know, we have a rule in place for those that are not familiar with it. It's called the Holman rule. But it's a way for Congress to be able to say, we're not funding that person's job anymore. And so, for example, this week I have an amendment to, to eliminate the salary of the prosecuting attorney in Delaware, the assistant prosecuting attorney, who blocked the investigation of the Bidens from the IRS. Those, those individuals in, ended up becoming whistleblowers and said that, that uh, this associate prosecutor, Wolf, out of, out of Delaware, that she blocked them at every turn. And then when they finally did get a search warrant, she tipped off the Bidens and told them about this. To me, the, these kind of people, we need to make an example of these people. We need to zero out their salary so that they, they, so that we tell the American people 
that, that we're going to stand for justice and we're going to send a message to every other bureaucrat that wants to use their office for political weaponization. So I think that we need to do that. But sadly, my prediction is that it's going to go down, uh, just like all the other Holman rules that have gone down, because this place thinks that, that that's too below the belt, that that's not appropriate or, you know, whatever it is. They think that um, there's, there's, this isn't the right process. We, we just need to elect the next president. That's how this place works. I had, a, I had a friend, Anthony Sykes. We served in the Oklahoma State Senate together. And uh, he used to talk about the, uh, uh, the kind of lawmakers that would turn their office into a barber's chair um, for lobbyists and bureaucrats. Yeah. And that the people that uh, felt the most comfortable, not the we, the people, the citizenry that you represented, but it was actually the, the, those that, that most elected officials were well-heeled, dog term, a well-trained dog, well healed to the money interest crowd. And I think you see a lot of that in politics. Unfortunately, you do. But uh, we've had these conversations about the amount of the authority, the congressional authority, that we've ceded to the executive branch over decades. And we've had those conversations, and I think it's very important that we need to get to working on that, to pull that authority back. This is only the first step in doing that. Uh, because how do you control behavior of uh, executive branch people, whether they be at the state level or the federal level, without just um, defunding them? Mm -hmm. That's the first step, because that is our authority, the power of the purse. That's awesome. So the, over the course of this year, you've taken some pretty bold votes, votes that I would call courageous. Um, talk about some of those moments you mean you don't you don't have to necessarily go into the details of them, but the how how what your thought process th thought process is as you're approaching some of these difficult votes, and and how where you kind of get your core because there's got to be a huge uh, courageous heart in there. Okay, can I based can on I, some can of I, can I set you up for this answer a little better? Go right ahead. So I've told people Keith's been in rooms, and I've shared this with other groups uh, that the most courageous. Uh, member uh, in the in the January head of the year uh, where the opposition to uh, at the time um, majority leader uh, McCarthy when we were all going through these rounds the 15 rounds saying look you've got to you know get to this place before we're going to feel comfortable that we're going to do the, the bold things uh, Keith was one of the 20 and uh, I you know for to, to join Freedom Caucus and be one of those that was you know kind of knew we have a game plan and and this is kind of our position statements and then to look across the room and somebody that I didn't know well who wasn't sitting with the Freedom Caucus was sitting more on the on the, the far right of the room, Keith stands up. And it was one of those that was in opposition. And Keith, I don't want to speak for you, but I'd seen a text that you'd sent out the night before where, just like me, you were greatly concerned about the funnel of the Rules Committee not allowing individual members to bring cuts to the floor or amendments to the floor that a process that had stopped seven years before yeah. and you had sent out a, on a chat i think you may remember that he sent out a chat questioning that you actually had the <laughs> statistics and uh i clipped that statistic because it was almost like in 1994 five you may know the statistic you the one who came up with the research on it that like 50 percent of all rules uh, were open rules that you could amend bills in the contract with America days under Gingrich. And we had re reduced that to like almost nothing, like 0%, 10% open rules where you had to get permission from the rules committee, nine members to put an <coughs> amendment for it. So you had kind of said something in the freshman chat and then the next morning you were voting in opposition and uh, I've told people, you know, it's one thing to be sitting with the Freedom Caucus kind of in those conversations. Another thing for Keith Self to stand up on his own while he's sitting there amongst everybody who knew was probably mad at you and for you to jump up and say, look, I, I can't vote for Kevin McCarthy in this moment until we straighten some things out. Well, I didn't plan this as they did. They were working on this months ahead of time. I made my decision late because I wanted to get to yes, but I wanted the rules that we yes. finally got. Yeah. So when it became obvious in a couple of those conference calls that we had, if you remember, we had two or three conference calls yeah. and the conference meeting that morning. It, I'd made my decision by then. But it became obvious to me that the majority of this conference really didn't want them. No, they didn't want those rules. They no. just 
They don't want to take some of these tough votes. That's right. They don't want to have, you know, my amendment come on, you know, that's coming up this week because they don't want to take that tough vote. And they don't want to have to go back. This is what I'm, I believe it is. They don't want to have to go back in district and explain. There's a lot of members that are upset. There's a lot of people back home that are upset about the amendment that, that failed last week, the Matt Gates amendment to defund the FBI's new headquarters, the $300 million new Taj Mahal headquarters. People back home don't understand why in the world would Congress give the FBI a new building given everything that the FBI is doing right now. And yet we had an opportunity for that vote and it failed and people back home are, are livid. I think there's a movement across this nation of people that are so frustrated with the federal government. There are different issues. Some it's inflation, some, of it, some it's the border, some it's the accountability. So there are different issues, but people are so frustrated with us and that's one of the issues. I mean, they, they want us to defund the FBI, not give them a new headquarters. So, yeah. Okay. Tell us about the committees or any kind of focused areas that you, are, that you focus on. Well, my focus is different than my committees. I'm on foreign affairs and veterans affairs. My focus really is, is twofold. It's the border. I'm a Texan. It's the border and it's the spending. Uh, we're over a trillion dollars in, in interest alone on our national debt now, and it's going to skyrocket. It's going up like a vertical uh, graph. So we've got to do something, but I just don't see the impetus in, in our conference as a whole. And the Democrats are certainly not going to help us with that. So, so these amendments that we're, we're bringing forth to, you know, for people to understand for years, they've locked it down to where whether it was Republicans or Democrats, they were keeping their members safe. And so they would predetermine a bill that would go on the floor. So it was a safe vote for either party, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. whoever the controlling party was. They would make sure that there were no amendments or very limited amendments that were safe amendments. And now we've kind of busted that process up since January. Part of the agreement for uh, Speaker McCarthy to become speaker was is we were going to allow spending cut amendments on all general appropriation bills. So amendments after amendments after amendments have been put forward uh, all summer up, and, up until uh, today as we're trying to wrap up the 12 appropriation bills. And so now people can go and they can look and see how their member votes. And those that, to your point earlier when we started this conversation a minute ago, where you said it's a difference between those who say the right thing and those whose voting uh, record will prove they're doing the right thing. If you want to know how somebody voted on the FBI headquarters, go look it up. You, there's a, there's votes mm -hmm. now recorded on on um, you know who's really for smaller government, who's for yeah. restoring um, the 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 sanity that was once here in Washington D.C. You served your country, um, and now we to your point a while ago about interest. There was a story that came out a couple of weeks ago that year to date, fiscal year to date, we had already spent as much on interest payments in the same time period as we'd spent on defense of our nation. Now, at the end of the year, we'll see if those numbers, if, if what we spend on interest is greater than what we spend on, on in defense. Uh, those numbers are yet to be gathered in some total, but it's likely we, this could be in the first year that that's ever happened. How scary is that um, from somebody that comes from the years of, um, you know, uh, the spy missions, James Bond, that you were uh, running to protect our nation, you and Tracy, and serving your country, you know, for as many years as you have. How scary is that to think that we've got a country now that's flushing money uh, just down the toilet, uh, and, and, and more so, just just interest on our debt, not no principal, compared to what we spend on an annual basis to defend our country? It's not only dangerous to the United States, it's dangerous to the world, because the trust and confidence of the United States government is the foundation of world economy. So it will certainly destroy the trust in our own government and quickly, I think. But it will also be very dangerous to the world economy uh, because once you lose the, the U.S. Treasury bond as the foundation, where do you go? It's not going to be the, the Chinese renminbi yuan. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the Russian ruble. Yeah. What's it going to be? Yeah. And there's two types of people up here. There's those that want the title. They, they feel like they, that this is the next part of their political career, the next part of their ladder or whatever, whatever it is. And then there's those like you who are here to save America. And I'm proud to be in the fight with you. I know Josh is too. Well, these two gentlemen are part of the fight. Let me tell you, I'm proud of the two of you for the stances that you've taken. We're going to continue to take them. I mean, let's don't act like we're done here. We're barely getting started. 
Well, thank you. Thanks for coming on, Keith. I know you're going to come on more more often. We we, we welcome you every time <laughs> because you provide a fresh perspective. You provide a courageous viewpoint, and you provide that that perspective from the from Texas. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I know Josh is from is North I'm Texas. I'm not from North, North Texas. Texas. I'm from <laughs> Oklahoma. I'm not from North Texas. Good gosh. Well, thank you again for watching this episode and thank you for um, sharing it if you, if you have. Please, if you haven't already, like and subscribe to the Fresh Freedom Podcast and share it with your friends. As you know, it's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Rumble. Anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you're, be sure to subscribe. Until the next time, we'll see you on the Fresh Freedom Podcast.